Uh, this morning, the title is going to be a bit about the Holy Spirit. You know, for the last, <clears throat> at least for the last year, you know, I've been talking quite a bit about uh, just things I see, I believe, coming on the nation and actually the world. Uh, you know, I don't think we're done with, with shakings. I don't think we're done with some of the uh, trials and, and uh, tribulations that are, that are coming up yet. I think we're going to have more things coming our way. Uh, I don't necessarily think things are going to get better in the natural. Uh, and so, like I said, for the last over a year, probably actually probably two years when I started that. But at the same time, uh, once you realize that the Lord also has answers to all those things. And one of those answers is the gift that we have through the Holy Spirit, the blessing that that is. But the problem is, you know, it's like um, if, if maybe you have an inheritance from a you know, relative, long lost relative you didn't know about, and maybe they put a several million dollars in bank accounts that's for you. But if you don't know it and you don't draw upon it, it doesn't do you any good. So my whole purpose today is we're going to go through, I've got actually two pages of scripture, so I won't have time to go into depth on any of them, but I just want to bring out the, uh, the attributes of the Holy Spirit and the benefits for us. And then after we go through all those scriptures, I want to come back and just go, kind of go through the benefits again so that we can begin to, to pull upon those things. Because, you know, that... The word says that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord lifts up a standard. So despite how dark things may be continued to get, and as they get darker, the light shines brighter. And he's going to address those issues. So uh, again, you know, I have this, this conflict of going, okay, on one hand, I want to make sure you're prepared for things that are coming, that you know that, that life is going to be a challenging but at the same time that the Lord has answers for all those things, and it's a glorious time. It's a time where the church becomes a church uh, and truly becomes that pure, spotless bride. So we're going to start in John chapter 7. If you turn your Bibles there, and the way I've got this laid out, we're just going to go through John, and then uh, after John, we're going to Acts. So it's going to be right the next book as we just kind of go through, uh, probably end in Ephesians. And we're going to start in verse just 38 and 39. And again, we don't have time to really go put all the context in here. But let's get these verses down. And Jesus says, Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living waters will flow from within him. Now by this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believe in him were later to receive. Now, up to that time, the Spirit had not yet been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So there's a promise that the Lord has given you that out from our innermost being is going to be living waters is going to come out from, from, from us. And that he promised the disciples and he promised us that this gift would be coming. So let's look at John 14. John 14, John 14, 12. I think one verse while we're there that uh, Nathan hit last week was something that uh, in the same chapter, verse 14, verse uh, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, just a little sidebar, that is probably one of the most offensive verses in the Bible that are going to cause people to hate you. Because they're going to say, you say that is the only way? How, you know, uh, how arrogant can you be? But yet, that is the truth we have to stand in. And this is going to cause people of every other religion that's going to stumble and even hate. But I'm not speaking about that today. We're going to John 14, 12. And it says, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. So that's a verse that we really haven't ever seen completely fulfilled yet. And many of your Bibles, uh, this is the NIV I'm reading from today. 
and it says many of the things, uh, many of your other translations will say the works, in other words, the miracles that Jesus did. So if you can imagine a church, the church, speaking worldwide, getting to that place where the works that Jesus did are being performed by the church, and even greater works than these will be done. That is yet in our future. So that's part of the glory that offsets some of the negativity that, that's coming our way. That will be fulfilled. Now let's drop down uh, verse 15 and 16. And Jesus says, I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may, be, may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. And if you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. Now, many of your versions will, instead of using the word counselor, probably say helper. Uh, either one works. But he said, he will give you another counselor, another helper to be with you forever. And it is also the spirit of truth. That's where we find out what truth really is. And it says, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. So it says the world cannot accept him, but that the Holy Spirit will live within us and be within us. Now, if you drop down to verse 26, he says, But the counselor, or depending on your version, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things, and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Because the Holy Spirit will teach us. That's how we, we learn. That's how, as we get into the Word, it will bring to our remembrance scriptures that fit the situation that you're in. But it's the Holy Spirit. But you have to be putting the Word in you, and then you have to be calling on the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is a person. You know, it's not a force. It's not like Star Wars and the force. It is a third person of the Trinity. We call the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three in one, one in three. But those are promises that he will remind us of things, of everything that Jesus has said. Now, if you drop down to, uh, actually, we're going to go to chapter 15. And we're going to look at just one verse, verse 26. And Jesus says again, When the Counselor comes, or the Helper, whom I will send to you, the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you must also testify, for you, for you have been with me from the beginning. But he says, The Spirit of Truth, who goes out from the Father, will testify about Jesus. Now, since we're right there at chapter 16, we're going to go to the verse 5, and again, we're just going to have to run through these pretty quickly. We're going to go through 5 through 15. And Jesus says, Now I'm going to him who sent me, yet none of you ask me, where are you going? Because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth, it is for good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go away, I will send him to you. Let's stop right there for a sec. Think of that. So Je the disciples have been walking with Jesus for three and a half years. In the flesh, getting his teaching, interfacing with him. And yet he says, you know, it's better for you that I go. Because if I go, the Holy Spirit will come and live within us. Okay, verse 8. Now, when he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment in regard to sin. Because men do not believe in me. 
in regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father, for you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take you, will take from what is mine and make it known to you. So he also goes on and says he will convict the world of guilt and sin. It says when the Spirit comes, he will lead you into all truth. Now that's where you get that knowing with side of you when you hear of something that's just not right. Kind of a flag, red flag goes up and you go, something's off. May even be, sound like partial scripture, but something sounds off. That's the spirit of truth that within each of us that will tell us that. And another thing that we need to actually begin to ask the spirit, it says, and he will tell you what is yet to come. So things of the future, what's coming. We should begin to ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, show us what are those things that are coming? What's coming, and then how do I respond to those things that you show me that are coming? And he'll have an answer. He will guide us and direct us. But we need to have an expectancy that he will do that. Okay, now we'll go over to the book of Acts. Like I said, we're just going to go next book over, Acts chapter 1. And just going to look at verses 4 and 5. And this is after Jesus has uh, risen from the dead, and as he's uh, appearing to the disciples over a period of, of 40 days. And it says, On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my Father's promise, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized you with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So again, he gives them that same promise. He tells them not to leave, stay in Jerusalem, because what I have promised to give you is about to come. And we find the answer to that in Acts chapter 2, in verse 1 through 4. It says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enables them. Now go ahead and drop down to, to verse 14. It says, Then Peter stood up with eleven, and he raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you and listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It is only the ninth hour in the morning. No, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last day, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see vision. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in these days, and they will prophesy. Now, verse 19 through 21 is yet ahead of us. But the fulfillment of this part up to, to verse uh, 218 was filled on the day of Pentecost as the Spirit was poured out. And it's interesting that it says that they were accused of being drunk because sometimes when the Spirit falls, especially in a corporate setting, uh, it can be things that are 
rather strange, uh, and yet we are told later not to despise the spirit. And in this case, they thought they were drunk because they were speaking in other tongues and giving a message. But again, he says that he will pour out his spirit on all flesh, both men and women. I will pour out spirit in these days, and they will prophesy. All right, Acts chapter, well, let's go to Acts chapter 5. Now, rather than read this whole passage starting with verse 1, I'll just kind of give you the, give you the story. So this is the story of, of Ananias and Sapphira. And this is at a time where uh, the church has been growing. You know, in that first sermon that Peter gave his first sermon, you know, they, they went to 3,000 people uh, in one message. Uh, didn't even get his message finished before people started being filled with the Spirit. So people were giving, bringing, you know, selling property. They were selling goods, making sure that anyone poor in their midst had enough so that no one was without and so this is going on. The church is, is having all things common in common. And uh, right before this, in the, in the chapter uh, end of four, Barnabas is one that comes up, has sold some property, and he brings up and he gives the money to the church. And so in this case, so we have uh, a man by the name of uh, Ananias and his wife Sapphira. They come into the church, and uh, they come up to Peter, and they're bringing the, the money, supposedly from the sale of this land. And... Uh, uh, Peter says, basically, why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? He says, when you had this land, you know, the land you had, the property you had, it was yours. You could keep it, or you could sell it, and you could bring part of the funds to the church. But what they have done is that they said, yes, we have sold this land for certain, let's say, $100,000. We brought it in, and we brought the full $100,000. And Peter confronts him and said, you know, you have not lied to men, you've lied to the Holy Spirit. And then he falls dead right in front of the church. So all the young men, they have, they have the young men come up, pick him up, carry him out to bury him. And it says about three hours later, uh, his wife comes in. His wife doesn't know what has happened. And... Uh, so Peter asked, did you, uh, you, know, you and your husband sell this property and was it for such and such amount? And say, yes, yes. And he said, why have you agreed together to test the Holy Spirit? And then she falls dead right there. And said, she, he said, you know, the men who just buried your, your, your husband are at the door. So it was a kind of a bummer day for the young men because they were burying people all the time. But it does show that there's a principle, there's a spiritual principle with that, and that is this, that what you get away with in the outer courts can get you killed in the Holy of Holies. So, in other words, like right now, a lot of we can get away with a lot of things, but when the Spirit is moving and the power is being manifested and we're seeing miracles, signs, and wonders, you have to be very careful how you walk. So we're Remember that, that what you get away with in the outer course can get you killed in the Holy of Holies. So that's chapter 5. So it's, you know, it's benefits, attributes, but there's also a warning that goes with it, that you take the Holy Spirit seriously. Okay, Acts chapter 7, and we're just going to look at verse 51. And this is the story where Stephen is uh, being confronted. He gives his, actually, a long speech about the history. And he confronts the Jewish people and he says, You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your father. You always resist the Holy Spirit. So again, that's another thing we don't want to do, another warning, do not resist the Holy Spirit. All right. Now I want to go to Acts chapter 8, next chapter. 
verse 39 and 40. This is a story about Philip. He was one of the seven. And he, had, he was actually, uh, had been told to go to Gaza, and there's a, a, there's a, a eunuch from, uh, from Ethiopia who's coming through, had been to Jerusalem worshiping, was going back home, and, uh, and he's reading the scripture, and he happens to re be reading Isaiah 53, and the Lord tells, the Holy Spirit tells Philip to go join him uh, with his chariot. And so he does, and, and he hears him reading that, and he says, you know what you're reading? And he says, well, how can I know unless somebody shows me? So anyway, he begins to interpret for him. But the cool thing is, in verse 36, is as they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down to the waters, and Philip baptized them. Now when they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azos and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. So Philip was transported, kind of like beam me up Scotty, except that was transferred from one physical location to another location. How cool would that be? So that's our expectation to begin to have expectations for things of that to happen. That as things, again, get more tense, as things get um, shaking, that the Lord has answered for all those things. And we're going to see some incredible things. Be transported in the Holy Spirit from one location to another. Acts chapter 9, and just verse 31, again, just one verse. It says, Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. So this was right after uh, Saul who later became Paul, was converted. But it said the Holy Spirit strengthened and encouraged the church. And they grew in numbers and living in fear. So another important as attribute of the Holy Spirit, that it strengthens the church and encourages the church. Now chapter 13. Turn over. Verse 2 to 4, this is in uh, Antioch, and this is the, plus, the first location where uh, Christians were called Christians. First, it says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they prayed and fast, they placed their hands on them, and sent them off. So this was the first apostolic team that is being sent out. But it says, while they prayed and fast, the Holy Spirit said or led everyone to believe that, that, that Saul and Barnabas were to be uh, prayed for and then actually sent out to begin to spread the word. But it was by listening to the Holy Spirit. All right, now let's go over to uh, Romans, next book over, chapter 7. Just kind of working our way through it. In verse 6. It says, by now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law. So that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. So we are to be led by the Spirit. We are to walk in the Spirit. Be in sensitivity to the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will give you, again, checks in your spirit. It will also convict us of sin. 
Now, in chapter 8, we're right there close, chapter 1, or chapter 8, verse 1. This is probably one of the most glorious statements in the Bible. It says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit has set me free from the law of sin and death. Hallelujah. How, much, how each one of us, you know, each one of us has things that we have done in our past that we are, uh, would be embarrassed about, that we would be, uh, even have shame about. And yet, we have that promise. There is now no condemnation in those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit has set you free. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Glorious verse. All right. Acts, or I'm sorry, Romans 8. We're going to, same chapter, drop down to verse 26. It says, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Now, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts know the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with his will. So there's times when we don't even know how to, how to pray. But it says the Spirit helps us in our weakness, and the Spirit even intercedes for us. So that's another huge benefit. And that's also where your, your prayer language comes in. Because many times, you know, we don't know about a certain situation, how to pray about it. But if we were praying the Spirit, we're praying the will of God. And it helps us, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. And I think we can all agree there are times when we are weak. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This is talking about the gifts of the Spirit, specific gifts. And we have a couple of different lists, one in Romans and then Ephesians, and this one in, in, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So we're going to start in verse 1. It says, Now about spiritual gifts, brother, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore I tell you, no one who is speaking of the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. Now, there are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, to another, the message of knowledge by the means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between Spirit. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, to interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and of the same Spirit, and He gives them to each one just as He has determined. So the Lord has distributed gifts. Each of us, it says, each one has a manifestation, has a manifestation of a gift. Now you may be thinking, well, I don't know what that gift is. Well, that's something to begin to ask the Lord for. And it's not for you as it is as much it is for you 
to bless others with, to use your gift to bless others. And the gifts are all different. And it says, he gives them as he wills to each one he's determined. But they are for the building up of the church, for building others up. It's not so we can have a, a feather in our cap, but it's so that we can bless others. And so there's going to become an, a greater manifestation of all of these gifts, the nine different ones that are listed here. And when it talks about the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, it's not talking about that you were born with a high IQ. This is talking about a supernatural gift for that moment that gives you a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge about something you did not know. So these are all supernatural gifts. And those things we are, in fact, if you turn over actually to the next chapter 4, to 14, I'm sorry, Verse 1, it says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, and especially the gift of prophecy. So we are to eagerly desire those spiritual gifts. But again, it's not just for our own uh, self-worth. It's for us to bless others with. But we are to earnestly desiring. So in other words, you need to be asking the Lord, Okay, Lord, what's, what's the gift that you would have for me that I can bless others with? Okay, 2 Corinthians. Right next door. Chapter 1, verse 22. says he, he has set his seal of ownership on us and he's put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come so in other words we have all been those who have given your heart to the lord have been sealed with the holy spirit the holy spirit seals us it's his uh his seal of ownership over us which also prepares us for all those things, the inheritance that is yet to come. Some of those things we talked about, the marriage supper of the Lamb, the glory of eternity, all those things. And so if someone ever asks you, have you been sealed? You can say, yes, I've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit seals us, and it's our, it's our deposit guarantee. In fact, if you look over uh, in, down to verse uh, 17 and 18, chapter 1. Well, we might. 3, I'm sorry, chapter 3, verse 17. It says, Now the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So in other words, the Holy Spirit is the one who transforms us from the inside out. So as he begins to work, as we begin to yield to the Holy Spirit, as we begin to listen to the Holy Spirit, then he begins to transform us more and more into the image of Jesus, which is our goal. Not that in this life we will make that, but he continues to, to work within us. That doesn't mean we don't have our part. We do, because, you know, like Paul would say, you know, you know I, I train harder than all the rest of them. I work harder. But it is the Holy Spirit within us. If we will listen, be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, we will begin to be gradually transformed into, from glory to glory. All right, Galatians, it's just the next book again over, Galatians chapter 5. And we're going to look at uh, verses 16 through 18. And 
And it says, so I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. So there is a war going on within each one of us. You know, our, our old nature, our flesh nature, and the spirit. Spirit wants one thing. You know, we still have portions of that old man living within us. We still have that flesh we're dealing with. And so there, there's, a, there's a war going on and for each of us. And as we battle against those things, some of those issues you may have battled with years ago, you don't even battle. They're not even a temptation anymore. But the battle never ends. We just continue as we're being refined and we're going from glory to glory. The Lord just, the Holy Spirit begins just to refine us more and more. And things that you wouldn't even thought was an issue five years ago, all of a sudden the Lord is, is bringing conviction on you. And it's because he's bringing us to that place. But there is a battle going on within each of us. And there will be. And that's why we yield to the Holy Spirit. We resist uh, the sinful nature and the flesh. Now in Ephesians, which is the very next book over, about a page over here, in chapter 1, we're going to look at verse 13 and 14. And it says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the words of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So you are marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, and he is, that is, our deposit guaranteeing. So in other words, we've been given a deposit of things yet to come. The future, the glorious future, is like you have a down payment that has already been given us. Now, in Ephesians chapter 4, there's a little bit of a warning. In verse 30, It says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So in other words, we can grieve the Holy Spirit. You never probably think about that, but that many times we can hurt the Holy Spirit by our actions or by our attitudes. And that's why we always want to be open to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Another one would be, you don't need to turn there, I just read here, but 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, he says, Do not put out the Spirit's fire, and do not treat prophecies with contempt. So when the, the Holy Spirit's fire is moving, again, it's kind of like Acts chapter 2, when the Spirit was moving, when there was that outpouring of Spirit that we're praying for, that we're asking for, it does cause manifestations of the Spirit, which can be, uh, offensive to some, but we don't want to put out the Spirit's fire. So we have attributes, we have benefits from the Holy Spirit, we also have warnings about the Holy Spirit. We have Ananias the fire, we have a warning not to grieve the Holy Spirit. But we need to begin to pay, especially the focus upon the Holy Spirit, remember how Jesus said, you know, it's good that I go away. And, and we're going, how can that be? How can that be when you were walking with those disciples and they saw you day to day? How can it be better for us if you went away? And yet he says, yes, it's better for you because I'll send the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the counselor. And so I just kind of want to read through some of these attributes again. And it says... Uh, of course, John 14, 12, again, the works that I have do, greater works shall you do because I go to the Father. 
So that is yet to come. That's yet ahead of us in the future. It also says the Spirit is a counselor. He is a helper. That the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. And he will be in us. So that's a promise. Lead us into all truth. It says the helper or the counselor will teach you all things and will remind you of his word. So as we begin to study his word, the Holy Spirit will bring back to those specific instances that you need that scripture for, will bring it back to your memory. The helper, the counselor, will teach you all things and remind you. He will also be the spirit of truth. He will testify about me. But he will also convict the world of guilt and judgment. And then he will guide us into all truth. In other words, that knower that's within you. He will tell you what is yet to come. He will tell us what is yet to come. He will give us insight. He will give us wisdom. And he will always bring glory to Jesus. He will, we will receive power. And not only just power, but also power to be his witnesses. As the sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams, and the Spirit will be poured out on both men and women. And then we have the warning from Acts chapter 5 by Ananias and Sapphira that during those times when the Spirit is moving and we're on a different level than where we're at now, you need to be careful how you walk. And not be lying to the Holy Spirit. And then we have the, the story of Philip again, where he was transported in the natural from one physical location to another location. How the ch church was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit and grew in numbers as the Holy Spirit moves. How the Holy Spirit set uh, Paul and Barnabas apart for specific ministry, for, those, for that apostolic calling. How we serve in a new way of the Spirit and not in the old way. The law of the Spirit set me free from the law of sin and death. Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. And the Spirit intercedes for us. And that we have spiritual gifts, a couple different lists of spiritual gifts that each one of us has been given, and that we are to earnestly desire those spiritual gifts. And again, not just for our own self, but it's for the body. It's for building up others. And we are also told in uh, 1 Corinthians 14 to eagerly desire the spiritual gifts. We're also told that his seal of ownership on us a deposit guaranteeing the things that are yet to come in the future. So we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. That is your guarantee. When the Spirit, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, and we are being transformed from glory to glory in His image through the Holy Spirit that was in each of us. If we will yield to the Spirit, and live by the Spirit and not to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Again, that battle that's going on within each one of us, as the Holy Spirit is trying to bring us to a place of holiness, and our flesh nature sometimes resists that. And we are not to grieve the Holy Spirit with which you were sealed. So the Holy Spirit is a person the he it's a person who wants lives in us that we need and if you've never uh, been baptized with the Holy Spirit or if you want more of the Holy Spirit or if we will go back to to Romans chapter 8 and you are still stuck in a place of something that you have done in the past that has that has cut you off that you just feel like you know, shame has come upon you because of that. 
where the Lord wants to set us free from that. There is now no condemnation. It's time to move forward and go on. Because each one of us in here have things that we have done in the past, again, that we are, that we are ashamed of, that we regret, but the Lord breathes upon us and the Holy Spirit is in us to bring us in that place of walking. As long as we've repented of those sins and are, are running towards him. You know, it's that old saying that you, you never run away from the Lord. You always run to him. Even in the midst of your failure, our natural, uh, you know, natural response is that we don't want to be close to God. You know, we've, we've, no, we've, we failed, we've fallen away, we've, you know, we've, uh, whatever it is, and yet we're always to run to the Lord. And he's there as long as we repent with open arms to receive us and take us. But the Holy Spirit is critical during this time and this, this time that's going to be unfolding because there are more shakings coming our way. We are not out of this by any means. And there's more division, but there's more glory. You know, more darkness, there's more light. So we need to, to take the tools that the Lord has given us and use them to expand his kingdom and his church because there's glorious days ahead of us in the midst of shaking, in the midst of some tough times, in the midst of, of circumstances not necessarily being good. But that's all right. We have a future. We have eternity with him. Just some of those songs we sang about, you know, the married supper of the Lamb, the glory that awaits us. And if the Lord knew that you would be alive at this time, he will equip you for everything that you need to be able to, to shine during that. So anyway, I want to end with a word of prayer. And again, just we'll, we'll be doing one uh, worship song at the end here. And if anyone would like prayer, just feel free to come up. And just begin again to begin to call upon the Holy Spirit, that third person of the Trinity. Begin to make sure that you're taking advantage of those things that have been given to us that if you don't know it or if you're not drawing on it, it's not doing you any good. And we need to be drawing on what the Holy Spirit gives us. So, Lord, we just, uh, as we just come this morning, Lord, and we just thank you for that gift that you have given us of the Holy Spirit that has so many benefits, so many godly attributes, Lord. And we want to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Lord, we want to be a people walking in the fullness of all the gifts of the Spirit. Lord, that we minister to others in the power of the Holy Spirit. So we just say, Lord, we welcome you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you as a congregation. We welcome you as individual. We need you in our lives. We're wanting and desiring more of you. So Lord, I ask for your help. I ask you are the helper. You are the counselor that you would come even today and just would touch someone in a new, powerful way. It is also through those gifts of healing, one of those nine gifts of the Spirit, that healing comes to people. So, Lord, we ask that you would equip this body, that everyone would be walking and manifesting their spiritual gifts. So, Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We thank you for that gift that you have given us. And Lord, we long for the day of your coming. But Lord, in the meantime, we want to walk in the fullness that you have for the human heart. Everything that you have, Lord, we want to walk in it. So I ask for your help. I ask for your, your quickening in us. And Lord, that you would use us to further your kingdom until your kingdom comes and your will is done in this body and in us as individuals. And we just give you the praise.